Can anybody hear me? What's up, everybody? Hey. Charles, man, long time no talk. Charles, can you hear me? Charles. Raphael, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you now, yeah. I'm, I'm having problems with Charles right now. Yeah, it looks like he disappeared. I don't know what's going on. He was just yeah, here. He Raphael, how you doing, man? I'm good, man. What is is it Steven or Stefan? Steven. Steven, all right. Yeah, man. Uh, <coughs> he what was just... What time, what, what time zone are you in? I'm at Eastern Standard Time, so it's midnight where I'm at. Oh, oh yeah, you tired, man. I'm, I'm beat over here, man. <laughs> <laughs> where are you? I'm in, I mean, uh, I'm in Central Time Zone. I'm in Alabama right now. So that's what, uh, 11? It's 11. Yeah, it's 11 o'clock okay. now. Yeah, man. I'm, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a long day for me. But, uh, yeah, there you go, Charles. What's up, man? Nothing from Charles. I can I can see you, but I can't hear you. I can't see him. Nothing. Yeah, I can see him. He was playing with his phone for a second, but I don't, I don't see, I don't hear anything. Uh, let's see if we can, let's see if we can do a chat. Let's, let's write him something real quick. Oh, I see him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, hey, your audio's off. Take it off mute. Or you can switch. You can, he can see, should be able to switch to his cell phone. Yeah. You see that, Charles? You see that? <coughs> if you can hear me, put your thumbs up, Charles, because we, we can't hear you at all. So, okay, okay, we can't hear you. Okay, cool. Well, anyway, Raphael, man, so I, 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 have I talked to you before? We haven't talked, we haven't had a podcast together, have we? No, 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 no. Definitely not. Yeah, I know I've, I know I've talked to you on Twitter before because I, I remember the, I recognize the flags. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I recognize pictures, man. So that's how I uh, I keep up with everybody on Twitter. I, I remember their pictures and like little parts of their bio, man. But anyway, how's how's your day been going so far? Today is cool, man. Uh, wondering what's up with Charles. I guess he doesn't know how to do stuff when he's sober. It's all good, man. We got time. <laughs> <coughs> we got we got a whole Can lot of time, hear me? man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Thumbs up. Now. So the audio is not going to be as good on the phone. I'd rather it be coming from the microphone. Did you, did you, when you, when you set up, when you set this up, did you say computer audio or did you set it up as a phone call on your computer? Um, probably computer audio. Yeah. Cause that's what I did. And it's, uh, that's how I got to that. That's how I got to where I am now. But anyway, yeah. long story short, Charles, I haven't talked to you in like a year, man. Yeah, it has been a while. It's been, yeah, I think it's been longer a than a year. year. Yeah, it's been a while. It's like a year and a half, man. Yeah. Definitely, definitely did some time. You were, you're out traveling the world, so. <laughs> still, I'm still, still I'm still doing it, man. It's, uh, it's tiring, man. <laughs> Cool. Traveling the world to Alabama. Okay. Man. Yeah, man. He's from Alabama, though, right? Yeah, I'm from Alabama. I'm from Alabama, so I'm in a different part of the state that I'm from. But it's um, it's always good to be. It's good to know be places where you know everybody, you know. Right. Uh, as opposed to always being places where you're a new guy or you're an American guy or you're a black guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I speak for my whole race usually. That's funny. For my whole freaking country, man. But anyway, what y'all want to talk about tonight, man? So typically sucks, the way this man. works is, is we gonna... Raphael pulls. Mm -hmm. 
Raphael uh-huh. pulls a list of tweets, and then we kind of talk okay. about those different tweets. So it allows yeah, you to kind of it kind of allows you to expand on your Twitter. Uh, ah, kinda. see, this is perfect. So. There we go. <laughs> Oh, Charles, I want to tell you I miss you, man. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know where you were. You like, kind of like you kind of like fell off for a while, man. I don't know what happened. Yeah, man. I'm freaking stressed out, man. <laughs> It'll do it to you. I was, yeah, man. I was I was stressed a little bit, man. I couldn't talk as I didn't want to talk as much. So I was like, dude, I'm stressed out, man. I need to deal with my life for a little bit. And I'll get back to Twitter in, in in a while, so that's why I fell off. But I'm back. All right, cool, man. So let's kick it off. Tweet talks, episode twenty one. Episode twenty one, man, it's lit. We back. This dude Raphael out here taking breaks on people. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, yeah, I was pretty sick last week, so. Took a little break and then we couldn't really make up make it up. But uh, we're back. We are back. And we got a, an, another guest with us this week. Steven C Story. Twitter celebrity. What's up, World traveler. <laughs> yeah, what's up, y'all? What's up, y'all? Hope y'all are doing good. He's a, he's our third man. guest, right? Third guest. He is the third guest. Well, yeah, Tasha, Chris. Yeah, he's the third guest. He ranks up there with Chris, oh, man. man. He, he has a similar following, a similar man. viral capacity. Man, come on, man. It's uh, <laughs> I, I'll let y'all keep going. I, I'll start. I, I'm, I'm going to say my piece about all these things here in a second. But anyway, <laughs> let's go. That's I'm what we're here for, man. Before we jump in it. Before we jump into it, jump into it. Just tell the audience a little bit about yourself there, Stephen. Um, my name is Stephen Story. Uh, I'm from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I speak Portuguese and English. Uh, I have been living outside the United States for basically the last year. I come back in the States for maybe a couple months at a time, and then I go back out to a different country. So last year it was Canada. This year it was Brazil. Um, I have some online businesses. And my main source of income is the insurance industry, which I've been in for the past 10 years. Um, I don't talk a lot about insurance on the timeline because it's just really not that interesting. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I talk about the other things that I do for, uh, for income. And I talk about life and lifestyle. And, uh, and basically, these last couple, three years, I've been uh, building a lifestyle for myself. Uh, that's a purpose-filled lifestyle. So it's not just money and, and uh, material things, but it's it's my hobbies and, and how I enrich my own life through experiences. So um, that's really where I've been at. And Charles, I think you know me a little bit longer on, on a Twitter base. So I think about two or three years now. So you've kind of seen that a little bit uh, up, you know, more up close than, than people see me at, me now, you know. But um, anyway, yeah. So and I'm, and I'm really open, guys. So whenever, whenever y'all want to ask me questions, if y'all are watching this or you listen to this, shoot me a DM. You know, I'm not... I'm not going to be fake to you or something like that. If you, if you got a question, I'll answer it for you. Yeah, so get them the Twitter, the Twitter handle. Uh, my Twitter handle is my name, Stephen Story, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S-T-O-R-E-Y. So both my names are spelled wrong. <laughs> so you should be able to figure it out. Stephen Story, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S-T-O-R-E-Y. Hit me up on, on the DM or, or mention me and we can, we can have a chat. Cool, cool, cool. So let's start off. This is this one. Is, this tweet is kind of not basic, but it's like kind of common for this yeah. for this podcast. Mm-hmm. And Todd Millie, Charles, you said power is a team sport. So let's start <laughs> it off from there. It's so funny. Yeah. You always you always get like those the fresh tweets, and um, man, this actually this relates to the um the byron scott or byron allen interview and the dr claude anderson response to that interview and it was interesting because i mean i like byron allen for what he's accomplished but i think he's heavily heavily uh liberal in that he's expecting other people to do things for us that we could do for ourselves and so even now his goal and with the lawsuit i'm not sure if you guys know this but he's uh he sued uh, comcast nbc i believe 
um, over, I guess, not allowing him to participate in something. And so he basically alleged that it was because of racial bias. And so now they're bringing up like the civil rights action. It's been escalated to the Supreme Court. And his goal is to um, effectively, I guess, his, his, his idea is that if they lose at the Supreme Court, it could overturn civil rights of 1950, 1960 or even all the way back to like the 1800s. Um, and then Dr. Claude, I didn't get a chance to listen to the response, but he was talking about how like a better thing to do as opposed to just kind of waiting for them to overturn the law or create a way for you is to um, kind of build together. And so it kind of also relates to that whole conversation this morning on the timeline. People are talking about like, oh, well, we can't do this because of them or we can't get there because of that. And what I realized is like, I always talk about business and investor are a team sport, but then I realize like power is a team sport. Like you're not competing against one person. You're competing against a, a bunch of people who have decided to compete against you. And so that was kind of my, my whole statement in saying that is like, hey, like you're complaining about power. If it's not power, it's wealth. If it's not wealth, it's this. It's all these different buzzwords people are using to justify why they're not accomplishing what they want to accomplish in life. And I'm telling you, like there's always a workaround. There's always a hack. And sometimes, they, they show you what they're doing. And so it's just a matter of kind of mimicking what they're doing or mimicking what you see in other groups do. And so that's kind of where I was going with that. What you got to say on that one, Steven? Hey, man, I'm, I'm completely, I'm completely 100% uh, on board with that. You know, um, the thing about power, uh, as, as Charles, Charles, you know, like I use your real name and your Twitter handle like interchangeably in my head. So like, that's cool. It's all good. <laughs> I'm about to call you Ty, and then I'd be like, wait, his name is Ty. No, so um, you know, if we look at the inner inorganic world, right, the man-made electro electronic world. So guys, when I was growing up, man, I did a lot of construction with my dad because he he flipped houses, you know, in the early '90s and, and through the 2000s. So I grew up flipping houses. And, you know, the thing about power is that, like, like, for example, when you're, when you're wiring the house up, one little small wire really, really won't, like, do anything to you, right? But when it's connected to all the other power, uh, you know, the, all the other wires in the house, and then that wire is connected to the main line that's connected to the electric line, you touch one of those wires, it'll kill you, right? So it's the same concept in real life as it relates to people. One person can't do a lot but when that person is connected to a bunch of other people that's connected to the main line central banks universal systems you know university systems police all that stuff they can really put you in the dirt you know right. and so here you are playing playing with wires with wet hands by yourself you know yeah. and so that can be uh, a person and that's and that's it puts you in a situation like for example you're undercapitalizing the business world you're playing with electrical wires with wet hands Right. You you know, once you go up against somebody like that, they're going to put you out of business, you know, and I know that somebody's watching this has been put out of business because of lack of capital, because of lack of power, because you weren't connected, because it happened to me. I had several businesses and some were, uh, you know, undercapitalized, and that's why I didn't have the power I needed to to do what needed to be done. But Todd, I'm completely with you on that one. You know, power is a team sport. <coughs> cool, cool. So... All right, so I know both of you kind of touched on this one on Twitter. Somebody posted something about um, that the 50th percentile of income for black men is $23,000, oh, meaning that man. half of black men make less than $23,000 and half of black men make more than $23,000. I'm a little skeptical of myself. I'm not sure if this stat is right or not, but still. And you said, um, Stephen, um, the good thing is that there's a lot of room for growth. The bad thing is there's a lot of room for growth. So talk yeah, about yeah. Quick. Well, let's let's really go back to that for a second, okay? So in that example, that was white Americans and Black Americans. Like it was. I mean, I'm sorry, it wasn't white. It was just Americans in general. So like that study that they had there really wasn't. Um, it wasn't really correct. Charles, you know what I'm talking about, right? No. They they didn't have it set up. Okay, so that, in that whole $23,000 example, they didn't really have it set up correctly. But here's the thing, man. The average black man makes $46,000 a year. Okay, $46,000 a year 
ain't nothing to write home to mother about. You know, you can keep the lights on with that, but you're not rich. But at 50% being at 23,000, like I said, the good thing is we have a lot of room for, for growth. So it's a, so to, to go from 23,000 to 50 or 60 grand is learning another skill. That's learning how to sell something online. The problem is, is getting everybody on the same page to do that, you know, uh, to begin selling things online to begin, all right, maybe I need to learn a skill to get another $10,000 a year, you know, in income. So the problem is, okay, so what kind of person makes $23,000 a year? Well, it's a different person than a person who makes $50,000 a year. And that's where education comes in, at, you know, and I've written about this for you. I've written about this for years on Facebook and on Twitter is that until we double down on our black boys, because our black girls are okay. All right, they have really, we have really done a good job educating our black young girls into black women. But until we double down on black adolescent, black boys and black, you know, young men as they become come into adulthood, we're gonna keep seeing our guys stay at seventeen, eighteen, nineteen thousand dollars a year and be predisposed to criminality and you know suicide and all those other things. You know, so <laughs> education is tantamount to getting past twenty three thousand dollars because once you get past, once you get into college. And get some college, you're gonna at least get into the 30s per year, you know. I was um I was listening to this podcast with uh Earn Your Leisure, Wall Street Trapper, and he was <laughs> talking about how um they were all in jail because Wall Street Trapper actually went to jail. And so he was in a cell with this like white dude, and the white guy was like, You guys are playing the wrong game. He was like, You guys are out there hustling, doing all this illegal stuff, robbing old folks, making the dash, like you guys are playing the wrong game. You can put that same energy, effort, focus, intelligence, and creativity into actually like investing in stocks, starting your business, growing your business. So for me, the fact that those numbers are what they are is an indication that we're playing the wrong game. You're never going to really hit that mark if your game is employment, if your game is trying to get somebody to give you a raise, if your game is protesting for higher minimum wages. Like that can't be the game. Yeah. The game has to be, what am I owning? What am I buying? What am I building? What am I creating? And so for me, a lot of times we see stats like that and the immediate reaction is we oppressed slavery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Not, hey, maybe we're doing the wrong stuff with the freedoms that we do have. And so that's what I look at it as. It's like, bro, like 24 hours a day, the internet is 24 hours a day. Like, if you aren't out there maximizing everything you're doing, you don't get to complain about what you're not earning. If you aren't working weekends, if you aren't learning a skill, if you aren't doing all those things, if you're not maxing it out, you don't get to complain about what you're not earning. However, on the other hand, I wasn't, I wasn't surprised that the numbers were what they are. Because I feel like a lot of times people portray that they are getting it and they ain't really getting it. And so... <laughs> That's one of the things that's kind of unfortunate about like even the dynamics between men and women in America these days, where women have these standards that aren't in line with the data. And so women want, uh, what does the song say? Eight figures, something, that's her type. Like, he ain't out there. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so like, oh, no. you can keep complaining about it or you could just adjust. And I think that that's why um, what Stefan said, that's kind of the premise of, that's one of the, the, the premises of this show is doubling down on young men and putting them in a position to earn instead of saying get it yourself or instead of saying like good luck i did it nah i'm giving you no reason to fail and all the reasons to succeed mm -hmm. and i think that that's where the position need that's where the focus should be not on pointing at white people all the damn time yeah yeah man and you know and charles me and you have talked about this at length over the years man like it's almost like an old topic for me like i'm like y'all are still talking about this like <laughs> Right, right. But I'm like, I thought we stopped talking about this. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. but the thing is, is that, um, and Todd, I'm sure you've had people, young men, reach out to you, man. I got black guys, man, 19, 20, 21, Steve, man. How do I even begin to even think that way to begin making money? You know, how do I even think, you know, how do I get myself out of this situation I'm in to get me where I'm trying to go? And unfortunately, we have really done our boys a disservice, man. You know, and I'm an older, I'm in my thirties now. So like, I'm part of that problem and solution that look, I got to find a way to connect to a 19 year old black guy, a, a black young man now, because 
he's he's in a position at 19, 20, 21. If he makes a couple wrong moves, you know, he's out of it. He's out of the game, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether that's, you know, child support or uh, picking the wrong some, – some of these majors, man, might as well be child support because you can pay the student loan on it from now on. <laughs> right. right. And, and so I think that – um, but what I'm trying to say is, man, is that – I'm, I'm really sleepy, by the way, guys. So my thoughts are just ain't as crisp as they are normally. But but the main thing is this, man. It's like I think that um, so I was in Brazil, man, and I hate to talk about it, but it's a bunch of black people down there, and I got to see a different type of black culture. And I, I basically live in two different black cultures. I lived in Canadian black culture for six months, and I lived in Brazilian black culture for six months. And I wanted to see how that how they were compared to us. And I also got to see a black American culture outside looking in. And, um, you know, man, like being in Brazil, they are poor, okay? Everybody's poor. Like black people are po- poor for real. And they don't have that same level of consumerism that drives relationships, you know? In yeah. American, uh, American culture, and that's not just black culture, but in our culture, consumerism and capitalism, which are two sides of the same coin, well, consumerism is employeeism and then capitalism is entrepreneurship. Because of that, because in Brazil, they don't really have entrepreneurship in the way that we know, it, you know, um, and they also have consumerism in the way that we know it. And so because of that, relationships are shaped by that. So you have much more uh, natural forms of relation uh, with between a man and a woman. So when you have a different form of relation, but here's the problem, that sounds cool and all, but the men are uninspired to work harder, to make more money. <laughs> <laughs> it's just all good. Their, their, their women aren't like, hey, go, go out and make something. So it's a catch-22. It's not, it's, there is no utopia for, for black folks. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and, and Todd, I know you touched on what I'm talking about right now and on your old account and on this account. Uh, but <clears throat> I ain't trying to go all the, way, all the way there with all that right now. But anyway, Rafael, you got something to say? Um... Let me, I just want to touch real quick on you were saying about the whole income thing and being predisposed to to um, criminality, but you also said suicide. Correct. And I, I didn't want that to slip by so quick. Like, talk about that yeah. for a quick second. Yeah, man. I mean, like, first of all, we live in America. First, so off the rip, as men of of all races, we have high suicide rates. The second thing is that um, black boys, um, black boys, because of where we are as far as education and e- income, are are beginning to show higher rates of suicide at younger ages. Um, and suicide, because I was reading an article about it, it was saying basically suicide rates are going up because if you have something to blame your problems on, you're probably not going to commit suicide. But when they we internalize these problems, like you're the only solution to them and all that. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about personal responsibility, but they, they, they say that they can't blame all their problems on anything. They internalize it and, it and then they go out and kill themselves. So we have to, as older black men, we have to be more than what we think we need to be to these guys mm-hmm. in this day and age, because it ain't just about them resorting to criminality. They're resorting to all bad things. You know, it's not just mm-hmm. stealing, it's, you know, depression and, and drug use and, and, and all those other things, you know. <coughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So, speaking of um, earning your leisure, now, Charles, you said on, on Twitter, I know this was in response to, like, the Harlem Capital interview. No, not Harlem Capital, oh, man. but... John Henry, don't get rich on the fees, get rich on the carry. I knew you were going to answer that question. I did not want to answer that question. <laughs> no? But I, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of expand on it. Um, they were breaking down the VC fund, and they were also breaking down um, just the structure of how people get paid to manage funds. And they were talking about the 2 and 20 principle where you get paid 2% <laughs> of the assets under management, and you get 20% of the returns. And he was saying basically that like 
your goal shouldn't be to make money off of that 2%. Like that's just to float you. Your goal is to make your money off of the 20% because that means you're performing for your partners. And so I kind of took that um, because you can, I mean, he was talking about they raised a $25 million fund, 2% on that's like 500 grand. And so he was saying, yeah, we could live out of the 500 grand or we can go and put that 25 million to work and make them 20%, 30% off of that and they get 20% off of the back end. That's where you get rich. And so it kind of also speaks to that principle of you get, you become a billionaire by making, by creating millionaires. You become successful by making other people successful. So that's where the focus should be, but you still need that float. And so that's one of the things I, I kind of try to get our partners to understand. It's like, you still need the admin fees. You still need to be able to not have to work a job, which allows you to then give your all to that organization. So no, that's kind of all it was. I was just, I was just, every time I, when I see stuff and I hear stuff that I like, I just kind of fire it out there on the tweets just so that I, it kind of like locks into my brain sometimes. I like that. Hey, but, all right. But I, I got something to say about Harlem Capital real quick. A couple of things that I find interesting. Yeah. So it started by these four guys, four young guys. It's supposed to be like changing like the whole face of venture capital. Right, you know, right. Like people that look like us, you know, there's hardly any people that look like us in venture capital. And there's hardly any of any anybody looking like us that gets venture capital. And they're right. trying to change that. A couple of things I think is funny. The the Route 100 came out a couple weeks ago, a month ago, whatever, saying like the most influential uh, black people up there, was it under a certain age group maybe? I forget. And they had two things that was interesting to me. One thing, they had John Henry under the other guy, like ranked below the other guy, uh, Brandon, Brandon Bright, which I thought was strange because, Brandon Bright, yeah, so it was, it was strange because first of all, John Henry's everywhere, he's got, He's on TV, he's on podcasts. Everybody's interviewing him all over the place. The Brandon Bryant guy, you hardly ever see him. Right. Most people you see is he's doing, he's pitching for brands, big brands right. like Sadie's Bands and all these things. I'm, I thought it was weird that they ranked him higher than John Henry. Right. But I saw that too. I thought, I thought it was weird that their rank so high and their business hasn't really even made any money yet. Because we talk about Harlem Capital, as though they're already, as, although they're already successful, like they raised the money, but they haven't de deployed it successfully yet. I thought how that much, was kind of how much money they raised. Uh, so in the beginning, they, they were talking about in the interview. In the beginning, they were kind of just putting up money themselves. They were just making like little ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollar investments. And now they have twenty five million that they've raised. And so the goal is to okay. kind of deploy that and then get it back and then <laughs> re reload and kind of go after like two fifty and then go after half a bill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, another funny thing, thing is that why is John Henry even on the list since he's a black? But he's yeah, you don't black. think he's black? <laughs> not he's black. Puerto Rican. He is that black? That's what that's why he doesn't call himself black. Oh, he doesn't call he himself black. black. He's a minority. Like, he always talk about how oh, he's um yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. People of color. You know, that's yeah. that's where the people of color comes in. He's that's the only one who's not black in the group. Yeah. He never called himself black. That was all about Latino or whatever. You know? Yeah. And I, I know he dances around it a little bit. If you, if you really pay attention, he kind of dances around it a little bit. You know? Yeah. It's not a high bit, but, you know, I think it's one because when they talk, it's always about, you know, they want to invest in companies from the people of people of color and women. Yeah. So I'm thinking recently, so. That kind of like, we still kind of like screw. Because the investments you're making, you, you, you're investing in white women, mm -hmm. black businesses, and maybe a black female here and there. Not, I, I can't think of any that they did. I think they invested in uh, Labelly. Yeah. That's about it. So, but see, the thing is, though, the thing is, though, and he kind of made this distinction between being a VC. <laughs> and being an angel investor. And an angel investor is somebody who invests their own money. A VC is somebody who invests the money for others. And so since they went out and raised their money and they likely raised it from this, whoever would cut a check, they probably have, and this is, I, I forgot who mentioned this, but they were talking about like, one of the worst things you can do is raise a bunch of money because then you have money bosses 
And so it's not organic towards like, if I say I want to strictly invest in black men, but I got Billy backing me, Billy's like, you might want to broaden mm-hmm. that scope a little bit, man. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> I don't know what they're going to think about that at the country club, uh, Charles. And so it kind of creates a conflict. And that's why I'm all about building for self and ownership. Even, and that's why, like, I was thinking about this, like, people always make it seem like lack of capital is what's holding them back. Maybe lack of capital is a blessing. Maybe that is actually helping you to actually serve your true purpose as opposed to serving somebody else's purpose through you. And that happens a lot. People don't ever talk about it. There are a lot of people out there carrying on other people's agenda just because they're backing them financially and because they're paying them. Kind of, kind of, and I hate to say it, but like, it's really unfortunate when you see the community as a whole have an issue with a brand and then they go and they put a black face on there and everybody kind of flocks back to that brand. So for example, Gucci, uh, that's yeah. just the most recent example. Gucci. Or Papa oh, did John's a great pizza. Job with that one. Papa Shaq. John's pizza, their, their, their company was tanking and they're like, oh damn, let's get Shaq. And so it's like, it's really I disappointing, but it's not uncommon. They've been doing this since the beginning of time. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's like, I think people have to kind of wisen up and they got to realize like, it really is as cliche as it sounds, it's chess, it's not checkers. Like you got to look at the move behind the move. You got to look at like, oh, okay. Um, and it's kind of like Byron Allen mentioned this in the, in the show. He was like, um, he was talking about how there's this white producer and the white producer was like, I don't understand why you uh, aren't okay with just having like a black face. You want to have actual black ownership. And he asked the white dude, he was like, well, would you, how would you feel if it was me controlling the narrative for your community? How would you feel if I determined how your daughter looked at herself? How would you feel if I controlled the images of what your daughter saw on TV for white women? He's like, I wouldn't be for that, man. It's like the same is true for us. And so we got to really be conscious. Like you can't chase a buck. So many people out there chasing a buck. Professional athletes sometimes just chasing a buck. You are out there chasing a buck. And that's why I said this thing earlier too. I was like, we need to, and I'm not sure if we're going to talk about this tweet, but we got to focus on community, not just making money. A lot of people out there like, I just got to get my paper. And, and I, I brought this up and like all due respect to the homie, but like John Delia has this space. He has this commercial space in Detroit. And he was talking about like, what should we do? What should we do? And I was like, all the ideas that he put out there had nothing to do with that community, had everything to do with how can we use this space to make a lot of money. So either we're going to uh, sell, like create, sell weed, or we're going to grow weed there, or we're going to do something else that like, it doesn't help the community. And we got to build the community first and then get the paper. Because quite honestly, if you have a community, you don't even really need the paper. If you control mm-hmm. the cops, you don't need the paper. A lot of us are out here like, we got to get wealth so that we can have people treat right. us nice. Like, no, like if you control everything there because you built it, they're going to be nice to you by default. And so like, that's what I'm saying. Like, we need to control the grocery store. If you control the grocery store, nobody's following you around because they know you. If you control the police department, nobody's shooting you because you hired the, the cops. And so like, we got to take the community approach and let the money come. But if you have the community, you don't need the money. It takes care of right. itself. Correct. I completely agree and with that. Speaking of, Charles, you said on Twitter, think community, not making money. That's what I was saying. I knew you were going to bring it up. So that's <laughs> that's kind of me. But it'd be kind of cool Black. if he could, if he could kind of, if he has any comments on that, agree or disagree. Yeah, that's man. Fine. Yeah. So, you know, I'll take it a step further. And I think that um, in order for us to have good community, we have good families. And right. for in order in order for us to have good families, we need to have strong, independent black men. Okay. Right. Um, and that's that's really it. Okay. Like I mean, like I'm gonna keep everything goes back to the black man in our community, not the woman. Okay. Because if if all it took for us to be saved was our women being educated and finding you know financially good, independent, man. we would be okay, we we'll be fixed already. Okay, we're that's not fixed. We're actually worse off than we ever been. That's a bar. So that's that. Nobody's ever said to, that before. Come on, dog. But you, we gotta double down on That's us, hard. us, okay? Because if we're there and the woman is there, then we build a family, okay? And then we build a community. Because, because now, Todd, you're married. I'm not. But if you knew I was married, would you rather would you rather live next to me as a married man, or would you want want to live next to a bunch of single men and single women? You want to move into a community that's got married people there with children there. You know, 
and that makes a community. And then it's like, all right, well, we're going to have the Oglesby's over for dinner and we're going to talk about some things. It might be business related, might not be, you know, and we do that over and over again. That's when we talk about that power system, right? Just like, just like electricity in the house, we start to connect those circuits. And so, but they start with the black man. Until we double down and value the black man in our community, because we haven't for the last 40 years, until we do that, we, we cannot build families and we cannot build functional communities because we're missing half of the community. We're missing the black man. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. When you center POC and women, guess who you excluded? Black men. Right. right. Because just through the lens of colorism, lighter men of my, that are minorities are over black men in this, in this country. So until you center, how is it the black man not centered, and we're the we're the ones who have the least advantages if we're talking about the, the finance right. and, and you know career and all the other things here in, in the United States? We have the privilege of having a penis, okay, but it's also to our detriment, <coughs> hypersexualism, so on and so forth, mm. as you all know. You know, and anybody that listens, I'm sure y'all know these things. But what I'm saying is, t- we need to elevate the black man, not the black woman. She doesn't got right. Right. Get us right, and then we can get the community right. But until then, we're gonna be riding in the back seat because nobody right. values our opinions. And I'm not saying that on some woe is me. I've been away, I've been watching from afar, you know. Because when I was in, and I'm talking about Brazil because I, I live there, okay. When I was in the favelas, dog, even though they had poverty, black men were there, and so because black men were there, this is in a favela now, this is in a very po- poor area. There were grocery stores everywhere in the favela. They didn't have to walk far to get anything. I'm talking about all the business needs they needed in a favela. And a favela is what, it's like a basically Portuguese word for the hood, okay? They, they were not white Brazilians in favela selling them anything. It wasn't Chinese in there selling them anything. It was black people selling to other black people, mm-hmm. okay? They finished slavery after us. They got a affirmative action like in the freaking 90s or something like that. How are these Brazilian black people who look just like we do, by the way, all of us look Brazilian there in the city I was in, Salvador. How is it that they can still do these things in deep poverty with lack of education? Right. <laughs> it's the community, which is me, the family, okay? So until you get the family right, you can't get the community right, man. Facts. And that's not, a, that's not, a, that's not an economic thing. That's a social, that's a social thing, right? That's a cultural thing. So we have we have gotten to a point where black men are expendable and we just we can do it without him if he here if he not here we, he don't even got to make decisions for real you know you know we're gonna we're gonna do, do it without you and then when you have these things i was watching something man and i was um ethel's club in new york it's uh uh-huh. basically like a private little we works for black folks type situation and i'm yeah. looking at it and i'm like okay so what is this supposed to be about you know and what I gathered from it, and if any of y'all are watching this, uh, you know, I'm no offense, but I mean, this looks like a club for black women and gay people. Mm. <laughs> I know you're talking about. And, I, and I'm, I'm not knocking that. I'm just letting you know that's what it looked like because it's, right. it's supposed to be centered as a black space, but you don't have any photos of black men who look like black dudes. So mm. either all the black men in New York are feminine looking, or you want a certain type of man to come there. <laughs> You know, that's palatable to your black woman's senses of what womanism and you know, Afrocentrism and all that crap is. You know what I'm saying? But again, it's neither here nor there because I'm not really talking about money. I'm talking about a lot of cultural stuff. But, mm. but what I'm getting at, well, that's, that's getting more, more popular in our culture it de- because we're decentering black men, but it's at the loss of black men. You know? Right. <laughs> but anyway. I think one, one of the, the interesting thing about it is people don't re, people are losing, but they don't realize they're losing. They think they're winning, and that's one of the worst parts. I was reading this book, The Triple Package, and it was talking about how like African American people have the most pride and the most sense of self, even though they're losing. Whereas on the opposite, a lot of people who are doing the best tend to have a lower self esteem, meaning they feel like they aren't doing about. enough. I know exactly what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I feel like that's the problem is. We make the comment, we say, oh, women are doing well, women are doing this. And they kind of are, I guess, as you compare them to African-American men who are underachieving right now. <laughs> but in the grand scheme of things, we really aren't. And so I think that that's where we have to kind of 
narrow our scope. We have to look at like, are we really winning or are we just, do we just feel like we're winning? Because if we don't control things in our community, if we don't actually have any wealth, if we don't actually own um, homes that are appreciating the value, if we're not doing anything without the government assistance, then are we really winning? Because a lot of people out here, they're winning, but it's because the government is subsidizing their wins or because their family is subsidizing their wins or it's because other men are subsidizing their wins. And so I feel like we have to really take an honest approach and say, are we really winning? Because like you just said, if, if we could do it all with a woman, we would be winning already, or we'd be in a, in a position where we are actually like self-sustainable already, and it's not. We have communities that are still filled with crime. We have communities that are still plagued with poverty. Like we're not winning, we just feel as though we're winning because we can have these headlines that say, oh, we're starting the most businesses or we're the most educated or most all these different things. But what does the actual reality of that look like? It looks like a hidden L where they make you feel good, but you're actually losing. Um, and so that's mm -hmm. kind of where I stand. It's like, are we going to address the yeah, real no, problem? No. It's going to act like it's not a problem at all. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with that, man. I was, um, as you as you guys know, some of y'all who follow me, y'all know I talk to white people on Twitter now. So uh, <laughs> I get to see some really racist things, right? And um, these guys are talking about black people, just like uh, Charles was just talking about. He was saying how um, it was a study done. He was talking about how these students who, it was American students, is one of the racist thing. I'm sorry. It was, an, it was American students versus kids in Singapore, and it was about math. And even though American students uh, tested so much lower in the, in the math category, we had higher confidence. Well, the allegory is, you know, here we are, we are the lowest in basically all good metrics other than like, if there was like a dance metric, like an athleticism metric, you know, we're <laughs> at the bottom, right? And so, um, but we have so much confidence, right? And this, that's to our own detriment. Because being overconfident, man, is, is, is worse than being, you know, with, you know, having low confidence, you know what I mean? Right. But, but more than that, man, like, I was, um, <laughs> man, I got a lot of stories from these different countries, but I ain't gonna get into it too much, man. I was, I was uh, talking to this Nigerian cat, and he was like, you know, basically he was talking, he was talking down on black Americans. He was like, y'all don't do anything. Y'all don't do anything right. Y'all just shooting, kill each other, all y'all baby mamas and baby daddies. And I'm like, well, you know, we got this and that. And he was like, no, y'all really don't, you know? And I was like, you know, I was arguing with him. Like, I'm yelling. We were yelling at each other. You know what I'm saying at this point? Because I'm trying to defend us, but uh, I, I snuck some low blows in there. I'm not going to repeat it on the podcast, but I said some bad stuff about Nigeria in, in our defense. <laughs> of my people because I'm not going to let us go out like that but anyway I tell it to say this it's like <clears throat> something has got to give and I don't know how far we're going to go down this I'm a strong independent black woman and black women are the leaders of, of black America and the future is female and all that stuff how far are we going to go until we realize that hold up this ain't working right because right now the Right now, and this is another thing about, uh, and, and Charles, I know you understand this, because we are anomalies being part of suit Twitter, but it's not actually being part of suit Twitter. It's actually <laughs> saying that you are That's my first time you're successful that black man Twitter, and it ain't a lot of us <laughs> so we're perceived as being whitewashed because we work in corporate America or we work in white collar jobs. So our voices, because we're not as aggressive and down as our lower income counterpart, our voices don't count in our, mm -hmm. our culture. But in everybody else's culture, a white collar man is the is the be all end all. When he talks, everybody else stop talking. But for us, we get mocked because Jawan's Okunjufi. You know what I'm talking about? The author Jawan's Okunjufi made a book called "To Be Cool or To Be Smart," and it's called "A Black Choice." You, if anybody knows Dr. Jawan's Okunjufi, he makes these small little pamphlet type books. But it was basically talking about the, 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 the question that the black boy has to make in elementary and middle school, which is, do I need to be smart or I need to be cool? And so for us who have gotten to white collar jobs and making six figures, you have consistently picked being smart and not being cool, which takes down your social capital in the black community. You can't talk, you can't speak up anymore unless you're in the church or you're feminine. But again, mm -hmm. that's another podcast, so I'm that's not trying to go right down that road. But but 
Um, but yeah, so <clears throat> but I say out and say this is like, well, how far do we go? Do we do, do we do this another ten years? And we're forty years, fifty years removed from the crack epidemic. Do we do this another sixty years? Because I'm in my thirties now. We were we we were born at the end of you know like towards the end of a crack epidemic. So when are we going to get back to where we're supposed to be at? Right. You know. But anyway, that's that's very interesting. That. Yeah, that's crazy. <clears throat> what do you got for us, Raphael? Yeah, uh, real quick, you mentioned the Echoes Club. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard. It was in like that same article to the of the uh, the Gentleman's Factory. They're also in uh, New York. It's it's a no, social it's club like that. It's it, that one is for black men. It's okay. a social club, social co-working club for black men in New York. That one um, co-working club. Yeah, so it's it's the co-working. It's a co-working slash social club for black men. That, that, so it's like, co-working is a very unique sector of business. I was watching the uh, Wall Street Trapper. He was talking about how like it really is just like charging somebody to go to Starbucks. And so yeah. he mentioned that uh, Nita had came to him and said, hey, I want to invest in the WeWork IPO. And I think we were going bank bankrupt or something. It's bad. It's all bad for them. Um, mm -hmm. And he was like, no, nah, I don't invest in them. Like, <laughs> they don't make any money, but they also don't have any revenue. When he was making the distinction, I've made this distinction before as well where you have like companies that don't make money, but they generate revenue, which are two different things. So it's one thing to, to not be profitable and be like Tesla and operate a loss, but you're still like selling a bunch of cars. It's just, you're trying to get over that profitability hump, but it's another to just like be losing all together. So it's interesting to see all these like clubs popping up and it will be interesting to see how they, how they exist. I think that maybe in that sector, they can do well just because some people just want exclusivity. They just want to say they're a part of that club. And so they might be going there for social purposes, not necessarily to actually build a business. And so maybe there's some opportunity there. But you guys keep talking about, and I know there's one, the gathering spot in Atlanta, and they're actually talking yeah. about putting one in LA. You know, I got a lot to say about that. And I'm gonna say it from a real estate standpoint, because guys, if y'all don't know, I've had like a million jobs, if y'all listen to this. And one of my first things I did, I got a real estate license back when I was 20. And if you understand commercial leases, a lot of these people are screwed. And I say that because a place like Ethel's Club probably has a five-year lease. Well, if you know, like I know, if you can count every 10 to 12 years, we have a real estate recession. We had one in 19, the early 90s. We had one in the mid 2000s. We're 12 years now. past the last recession. Yeah. Now they could have got a five-year mm -hmm. triple net lease, a 10-year triple net lease. You're gonna be stuck with your with your pants down two years into into uh, Ethel's Club, and mm -hmm. then you know the recession hits, and then all these solo entrepreneurs are working at a call center again, right? And now you're you're dealing with you know seventy thousand dollar rent per month. Now what you do, mm -hmm. right? And you put a million dollars in the furniture and in televisions and you know in, in uh, IT for that place to have Wi-Fi and security and all the other things. I mean I'm just I'm just saying, man, when you see when you see the average man pulling out some stuff like this, this is basically investing, all right? Like whenever the average man starts doing something, you gotta be wary because something's about something's about to happen. And I'm not saying for the black people, I'm just letting you know. He said when <laughs> idiots become know. investors, it's time to head for the door. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, this one, I mean because this, listen, listen. Okay. No, I was going to say, this one is a little different. It's not just uh, co-working, it's like social, whatever, because they actually, like, they, they keep the prices low. It's like 24 hours, they can come and work, whatever they want to. It's not, it's not like a bunch of desks, like workstations set up, and you just pay your rent to, like, come and work, have, like, a, basically, like, an office. It's kind of like, like a, it's like a social club. Yeah, it's kind of like a social club slash co-working, but... It, <laughs> Steven does not like the not, idea of socialization. <laughs> nah, but no, it's, man. Uh, it's like... No, 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 but it's like, it's not... It's not like party. It, 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 they actually, they have a lot of stuff for the members, like... They collaborate. Are you trying to become one of the, a member of these clubs, Raphael? I might be a member. That's what it sounds like. That's what it sounds like. Let me sound like. look at the brochure. No, but I'm just telling you. Look at the brochure, it, <laughs> They do a lot of, they do a, <laughs> they do a lot of um, like <laughs> seminar, 
they bring people in to do like financial seminars, um, like talk about estate planning and stuff like that. It's not just about the co-working stuff. Well, let us know how it the, goes, man. <laughs> yeah, please. Now, I'll let you know. I'll get, I'll get, the, I'll get the guy in the podcast. How about that? All right. We, we, could, we, could, we could do that. I'll get him on. I'll get him on. Let him talk and stuff. So, Steve. Oh, yeah. What do you say now? This is pretty much, actually, this is kind of like what you were just saying. You said this is basic investing knowledge. And you see everybody go one way, you may want to start going the other way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's pretty much yeah, what you Yeah, man, I saying. think, you know, I think that, that um, whenever you start making businesses with social issues around them, it better be a pretty big social issue. If it's not, you're going to be screwed. And so things like, and I'm using Ethel's Club just because of where we are in society right now, culturally, with Me Too and, like, Black women are the only people who vote for Democrats in the black community and all that other stuff, right? When you start, so so perfect example of this was uh, when these feminists started a uh, restaurant where men had to pay more in Australia, okay? Wow. And it closed down in 18 months. They probably were bankrupted. I mean, they're probably going to be screwed for the next five to 10 years, <coughs> those business owners, right? And And what I'm getting at is, when you're serving a demographic like black people, and I mean black people as far as economics, okay? When you're dealing with the average black person makes $46,000 a year, and you're trying to get their uh, expendable subscription dollars, whether it's $100 a month, $200 a month, you're skating on thin ice as it is, okay? And then we're talking about, uh, so for example, and I'm, just, I'm trying to use their logic, okay? So Ethel's Club. Let's start one that's centering black women because black women are the, you know, fastest growing market for, you know, new entrepreneurs. But how many of them have employees? They don't have employees. And so, you're, again, those entrepreneurs are also skating on thin ice. And what I mean by that, guys, is they're undercapitalized. Right. Okay? So if your customer is undercapitalized, a small downturn could take 20% off your, off your subscription. You see what I'm saying? And we're not even talking about, I, I think that they'll deliver a good product, but what I'm saying is that, is that when you do those things, you make your market very small when you need to be big, especially when you're dealing with things like $100,000 a month rents, $50,000 a month rents, you know, and plus all the furniture you got to buy and all those other things. And, and, this, and that goes for everybody that's, that's thinking of an idea that wants to serve our community, guys. Real black power is serving all communities, not just our community. Right. Okay. That's what real black power is. All right. Because every other race serves every other race. Why do we only serve our race? Mm -hmm. I want to see somebody go sell some, sell something that's only to, to a different race. And, you know, and we make it there, but we don't have to keep all of our businesses in our community. We can keep our dollars in our community, but we let's have our businesses everywhere. Right. You know, let's serve everybody, you know? And so that just, that brings us to my next point. I know we got a lot of time left, but guys, stop talking about being a black owned business. Of course, you're black owned. You can't hide it. <laughs> okay. Some of y'all got names. Some people hide y'all names. Some people do. You know you black. You know Some people mean? do. Some people do. They don't have to, though. You know what I'm saying? But, and this is another thing I was talking to someone else about you yesterday. Guys, when y'all are saying, when y'all are talking about y'all's black business, support black business, you make your customer into a donor instead of a customer, and they treat you like a charity, and that's why they talk to y'all the way they talk to y'all. Mm. But again, that's neither here nor there. I just want you to understand how y'all are running y'all's businesses, okay? But this is wisdom right here. Hey, I like it. <laughs> I'll be getting mad about this stuff, y'all. You start pissing <laughs> me off, man. You know, but. Anyway, that's what I, Rafi, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, a little man. disappointed you ain't pulling none of my tweets, man. I got five, man. I got five tweets, bro. You ain't man, pulling got, none of my tweets. Right. Where are I his did, tweets, I man? I did a couple of them. I did a, I did Come a couple. on, man. I need some more, man. All right. You said you can't <laughs> respect anyone you have pity for. Victim culture makes people seek pity from others for attention and validation. Pity or respect? Dog. You can't have both. Come on, man. Come victim on, or man. victor, this is a daily choice we must all make. Come on, man. 
Which one is going to be, what? dog? I had a guy. <laughs> this came from a guy who was not a black person, okay? I have a lot of people that ask me to mentor them and all that stuff, right? So this guy, <clears throat> I'm not going to say where he's from, but he's not from the United States. Anyway, he's not black. So he was like, Stephen King mentioned me, you know, I'm like, all right. I and mean, he told me a story. He had a pretty heartbreaking story. I'm like, yeah, dog, I got you, man. Just, you know, hit me up here. I got questions. So he was like, yeah, man, I'm feeling this way, this way, this way. I said, do this. So I tell him to do this. Now, Charles, as you know, if you tell somebody to do something and they don't do it immediately, they don't want it, right? So I tell the guy to do the thing I told him to do. He takes a week to do it. It's all right. This guy's a loser. That's the first thing. Second thing is, and I said, <clears throat> he said, man, I'm so poor. I just wish I was a, a multimillionaire so my family could be better off and everything. And I was like, look, man, I'm not here to listen to you vent. T tell it to somebody else. You know, I don't, I really don't care. And I can't do anything to change it. Only you can change it. And he was like, well, you know, I just, I just don't think I can, man. What? You know what, man? How about this? I said, either mm -hmm. you stop talking like that, I'm going to block you. We can just do this real quick because I'm not here to kiss you on the cheek, man. You know, because that's how life <laughs> is, man. Like, pe people think I'm nice and all that stuff, guys. I am cool. But, like, when I see you start to pity yourself, I can no longer respect you. So, if I'm going to give you my pity, I can't give you my respect. And we're done with this mentorship. So, you got to choose. And I, I checked him, and he did not respond. Hmm. He never talked to me again. You know? But that's life, though. That's how life is, man. Life, these people that get out here, they, they, they trip and fall and, you know, skin up their elbow. Oh, my God, I just wish, I just wish I never tripped and fell. I'm bleeding. And then, you know, life is like, well, get up. Come on. You know, and that's these people doing this whole I'm oppressed thing. Why are you signing up for African-American studies? How, why do you need to study to be black? Explain <laughs> it to me. Like, seriously, I need I need to pay And paying money to do it, too. And they pay you to tell you that you a loser. <laughs> <laughs> they telling you you a loser. Look, man, I'm going to tell you something. And this, and this goes to any of y'all young people listening to me. If you're going to study black culture from the 1800s, study only the part uh, after Reconstruction. Only study blacks from Reconstruction. It's some of the most amazing black people. We're talking about real former slaves who had to do a real slavery, became millionaires, became senators, became business owners. Don't read nobody else until you get to the civil rights. Okay? You only need to be reading about those black people because those are our best black people. Former slaves who became multimillionaires in the United States of America. Men and women did this. Only honestly, they're more important than Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. They are they right. are more important than Obama. They're more important than everybody we ever have because they show our real resiliency before we start listening to white people that had good intentions that paved us down to hell. Okay, it was a a pathway of good intentions from white people that, that sent us straight to hell on earth, okay? All these progressive white folks in academia, the NAACP included, all them HBCU colleges that, that were started by white folks have indoctrinated y'all into uh, oppression and victimhood. Right. And y'all can stop me whenever if I'm lying. Keep going, man. man. Any of y'all can stop, <laughs> Go ahead, man. Can stop <laughs> me if I'm lying. Y'all can shoot me a deal if I'm lying, man. But I'm telling y'all, y'all getting taught to uh, hate yourself, man. And and, cause, and this is another thing, okay? And this is why I know these things are taught. I saw dark-skinned women in Brazil that had confidence, man. Real confidence. Fat dark-skinned women with confidence. When I see dark-skinned fat women here, they don't even look you in the eye. Because somebody taught them that it wasn't right for them to be that way. Mm -hmm. And I ain't talking about white folks here. I'm talking about black people, man. You know what I'm right. saying? And so mm -hmm. we have to seriously check what is being taught to us. And I have talked, I have talked about this. I said, what if we never taught our, our kids about slavery? Right. You what did say that. I remember that. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't they, like that. They, like, they were ready to, they were ready to <laughs> hang me off of that one. But it's like, <laughs> like we got no idea. Hey, well, tell me, <clears throat> huh? I said ADOS. I'm like, keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah, ADOS, right. But but here's the thing, right? <laughs> Why do we not talk about the first multimillionaire black man in insurance and how he found it? Um, how he found his insurance company by by insuring black miners because white folks went went uh went bury him, right? Mm -hmm. So he charged right. them all a nickel, a nickel a month or a nickel every pay period, and then somebody died and it cost 
like two hundred dollars to bury him, and he had to use all the money he had to bury him before all those insurance premiums came in. Once he did that, then he got all the uh, the black business, uh, all the black you know insurers, you know these uh, coal mines, and he became a very rich man in like the thirties, man, or the twenties. You you know what I'm talking about, Todd? It was Alonzo Herndon. Why can't we? Yeah, why can't we talk about that? I don't want to talk about a bunch of uh, step and fetches. Let's go talk about real, you know, real black folks that really made some, you know, they really conquered this world. In right. the fa- Let's go talk about Jack Johnson sleeping all these white women, throwing money at cops yeah. and beating up white folks in a ring. We can't talk about that. Y'all want to talk about Harriet Tubman still? Come on, dog. Right. I feel like in a lot of ways, I the mean, best black history is taught at home. And so, I mean, for me. Taught it. Come on, man. Yeah. Yeah, so for me, it's like we had a library of all those different books of the people who did something. And so, I mean, that's one of the goals for me to impart on my children. I mean, because I forgot who said it, but it was something along, something along the lines of like no intelligent person would send their child to be taught by their oppressor Malcolm. or their Malcolm. opposition. Malcolm said that one. Right. And so, yeah. I mean, yeah. you got to, you got to, these days, I forget, somebody also said something about um, nobody's going to teach you how to beat them. Nobody's going to teach you how to get ahead of them. And so we always come on and say, like, oh, why aren't they teaching us this in, in, in school? Like, because it doesn't benefit them to teach you that. They're going to teach you how to be a great employee. They're going to teach you how to do all these things that benefit them. And you got to teach yourself the stuff that's going to elevate you. You got to teach your children the stuff that's going to elevate them. And so that's the kind of position right. that I take. So, right. I like right. it. And it's, um, it's a, it's another book, guys. I really want y'all to read. Any of y'all that's super pro-black and y'all got something to argue me about, go read The Sweet Hell Inside. It's about the, the black elite directly after slavery. They were, these were black families that were millionaires like 10 or 15 years after slavery. And they were talking about The Sweet Hell Inside is basically about how alone these black families are compared to everybody else. These are Back then, guys, if y'all don't know your history, black people who had a lot of money normally were mixed. Okay, and they were cons- they weren't considered black like we are black, even though that still exists to a to a level now. Uh, right after slavery, mulattoes had a lot of power, especially in the Carolinas and in Louisiana. And so what wound up happening is they got sectioned off not only by race, but they, because they were mulattoes, they couldn't really hang with black people, and they were more educated than the average black person. And so this went on for twenty or thirty years, and they changed the laws up, and then all of us was niggas again, and so they lost their power and they lost their finances, you know, but, but it, it highlights a point of what I touched on earlier, which is that as you go up the ladder of success and income as black people, we, we become more socioeconomically moved from what it means to be black. Okay. As the, as the group, you know, as, as the masses define what black is, you know, and so, <coughs> um, and even in the Sweet Hill Inside, it talks about how their voices are negated because white folks know you ain't all the way down and black folks know you ain't all the way down because both parties have shunned you. Now, the problem is for us as black people, we got to decide, right? So we have these, uh, and I, I have another idea, guys, is that degrees don't determine pedigree, okay? So you, still, you have educated people that are still ghetto. Right, so they haven't made the jump social economically. They have made a jump economically, and they're still down here socially. And so we have this weird thing going on in middle class mm-hmm. Black America right now. Where we have a lot of hood people that are not hooded, hood in the pockets anymore. And so now we have to decide: well, what are we, what are we going to be here, guys? Because the middle class of Black America has only been here for thirty or forty years. You know, our true Black middle class. You know, and so we got a lot of decisions to make, and. Twitter, you have a lot of those, you see a lot of these things. It's not black on black guys, it's socioeconomic class on socioeconomic class. Right. You got a 20 year old black student who was poor two years ago, now they're a student, so they're in a transient phase, right? And you have people mm-hmm. like that are not in that, that, that social class anymore. So it's, it's a That's lot very there. true. That's very true. <laughs> like we have classes arguing class, but in the, in the name of race. And so you have, <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. very interesting. <laughs> yeah. What you got for him, brother? Yeah, um, it is getting yeah, late. I, I, got, I got another one of Stevens. Um, it's not exactly, um, on the surface, it's not like an economic 
money type tweet, but I think it kind of mm-hmm. is if you if you look at it the right way. You said your muscles know when you're half assing in the gym. Oh, Say oh, yeah. you're laughing the guy on the couch shit for somebody else. Oh now, yeah. You talk yeah. you talk about the gym, but I, I took that to me and a lot of other things too. Well, so let's let's preface that, right? So how you do one thing is how you do everything. Okay. When we're in the pursuit of money, we are energetically having a conversation on money at all times. If you have any understanding of money, money is energy, right? And our thoughts are energy. So we're having a conversation on money. So when you're, <coughs> you're half going about doing something in, in regards to money, you don't get it, man. The faster you go towards money, the more impassioned you are about going to get money, the quicker money is going to come to you. Because guess what, guys? Money is shy and poverty is outgoing okay so you got to go after yes. money fast okay you got to be energetic <laughs> towards going after money and if you do that money will come to you because that's the law the faster you go to money the faster money comes to you right and so money knows what you're doing okay money is like santa claus they know when you're sleeping they know when you're awake you know when you've been bad or good so be good good to say like that is money <laughs> okay so Money knows that, and that's why, guys, I'm going to talk about something else real quick, and we're going to talk about a really quick, I really like sales, guys, so I'm going to talk about prospecting. It's a 30-day rule, and so for you guys that are high ticket sales, it's a 30-day rule. For you guys that are drop shipping or selling a cheap product, it's a one-week rule. Whenever you prospect, when you stop prospecting for a day, within 30 days, if you're selling a high ticket item, and if, or within one week, you're going to see a drop in your prospects. After you miss one day of prospecting, if you miss a week of prospecting, you're going to feel it in your pockets. Okay. And then if you miss 30 days of prospecting, you're done. You're, you're in a slump. Okay. And that's when the law of need comes in. That's when you start feeling desperate. Todd, do you know what I'm talking about? Have you had this feeling before? You know what I'm you saying? Know. Where you, where you miss it. <laughs> where you, you don't really, I don't know if you're in sales or not. I don't know if anybody's in sales, but when you're not prospecting, Okay, let's just take it to something else like Twitter, right? Right. If you don't tweet for a minute, when you start back tweeting, nobody likes your tweets. Nobody yeah. retweets you. It takes like you gotta really like pump it up to you know really get going. Then you can start getting viral tweets once a week. But if you stop for a day or two, you just go, it's like dang, don't nobody like my stuff no more. And then after if you don't tweet for a week, it's like dang man, like am I even on Twitter anymore? And then after 30 days nobody is looking at your content and the algorithm resets on your account. It's the same thing regarding money. <clears throat> okay. So in a 30 day period, if you're not going after money in the next 90 days, you're going to feel it. If you slow down in December, you're going to feel it in March. Then the rules. Mm. Okay. So take from that what you will guys. And if you want to know more about sales and prospect, now you hit me up in the DMS or you watch some of my threads and I'll tell you about sales, how to make some money. But, but uh, that's what I got to say about that tweet, that that innocuous gym tweet. <laughs> <laughs> innocuous gym. What else do you have for him, man? What else do you have for him? There's a perfectly good. Time. There's a perfectly good reason why you leave the area you grew up in after you've made it. Look, man, Ty, don't don't make me do the dog. Don't make me do this, man. Like I, I really be like trying to stay calm, man. Let me tell you something, dog. That's not what you um, talk is about, man. Huh? That's not what you talk is about, man. No, it ain't. We talk so, is, you know, here's a we talk is about here's yeah. the thing. <laughs> this goes back to everything I said already, man. But it's about it was about the, this timeline discussion today where everybody was, you know, trying to prove to these freaking losers that black people can actually be something. And it's that if you think this is all that, that it is, <laughs> is it some Twitter argument? Imagine being successful and living next to one of these people. Okay? This is how you get shot in front of your business, Nipsey Hussle. Right. Every other rapper who ever got killed uh, in their own neighborhood, every other football player who got robbed, my boy from the uh, uh, Red Sox who got shot down in the Dominican Republic, going back and hanging out in your old neighborhood, you worth $200 million. You don't go back home. Right. Okay? You have to leave. There is a such a thing as black there. flight. There is a such thing in these African and Caribbean countries called brain drain when they dip. 
you can come to the states and Canada and Europe, okay? Because you yep. cannot stay yeah. there. You're different now, okay? And it's not they're gonna rob you, but if you think a Twitter argument, you imagine living next to that person for 10, 15 years. Right. Imagine letting, letting your, your kids go to school with one of them. Now, now they picking on your kid. I done made all this money. My kid got to go to school with your kid. You sleep, not me. Right. <laughs> not, not my kids. You know what I'm saying? And so that's what I'm saying, guys. It's, it's a it's a good, it's a really good reason to dip. All right. Like one of, but, one of the one of the worst things about people who are still in those <laughs> environments is they don't know they're wrong. They think they're 100 percent right despite facts that prove the obvious or prove the opposite. And that's why, like, when we start talking about Kanye, and we're like, oh, Kanye. He's crazy. And then you look up and Kanye made like 111 million last year. And they got 68 back in taxes. It, it, it boggles my mind that you have these people who haven't accomplished what you've accomplished, yet they want to argue about how to accomplish what you've accomplished. Like, that's what was going on on Twitter today. Is people were telling somebody oh who's done what they haven't done, that what they've done is impossible. And it was funny because I used to have that debate on Twitter a lot. And then I looked in and it was like just a whole group of people who were actually like, making the same arguments that like maybe Steven and I, and I have made like two years ago, last year. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. maybe we've caused a shift in the culture. So that now it's not just us who think that way. And now it's other people out mm -hmm. there who are getting to it and think that way as well. So I guess that's a good sign for the culture. Yeah, man, let's talk about Kanye for a second. Okay, let's just talk about who the, the audacity. Okay, God might not have given these people intelligence or courage, but he gave them audacity, okay? Kanye has a best-selling shoe with Louis Vuitton, a best two two best-selling shoes with Nike, a three billion dollar company. The dude got like twenty some Grammys, married Kim Kardashian, put four kids in her. Okay, <laughs> with platinum with a gospel album. Who does that? His wife gets niggas out of jail, and she ain't a nigga. Okay, this dude is literally affecting U.S. policy towards black people. And he's the crazy one. Right. Like, like, come on, guys. Like, explain that to me. How, and it's he's be, it's the because crazy they don't know any better. It goes back to what we were just saying. Like, people who aren't there, they don't even know they're wrong. They're so convinced that they're right, despite facts to the, to the opposite. Man, it's a shame, man. It's really a shame. And I was watching, uh, I watched my dog, man. I build smart homes. I think his name is Jamil Jamal, something like that, man. Y'all go follow him, man. He's a, he, I like his story, but you know. Yeah, we know Jamil. Jamil has sounded something like that. Yeah. Yeah, man. I like what he's doing, man. But you know, to see him be ridiculed by twenty-year-olds who the, the highest accomplishment they ever made was making an A in African American studies. That's the best thing you ever did in your life, and you're you're coming at this guy about something that he's doing how. You know, he can't do what he's, you're saying he's doing currently? Like, come on, y'all. But see, the thing about that is it goes back to what we were saying earlier, is that we don't value the opinion of men. And so, like, what frustrates Thank me you. about that is it shouldn't even be a debate. Like, if you grew up in a house with a man, it's not a debate. I tell people all the time, like, this isn't a conversation. This is not a democracy. I said what I got to say. <laughs> and that's just what it is. And you can fall in line with what I said. I think that's, Come the, on. that's the dilemma that we have. Do you see this? Yeah. This is a book. This it. is written in the 90s. Do black women hate black men? Yes. The answer is yes. Okay. I can open up any part of this book and it's going to tell you all these things. Pick a class. Got chapter three. Class distinctions in America generally are based on inherited wealth, blah, 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 blah. blah. Is the unhappy relationship between black men and women present in the highest income levels of the upper class? It's all talking about everything we're talking about. And this is from the 90s. This book is written in the 90s, guys. Anybody that's watching this, Do Black Men Hate Black Women? I mean, Do Black Women Hate Black Men by A.L. Reynolds. This talks about all these things we're talking about, guys. Let me tell you something. The black man's voice does not matter if it's not inside the bedroom. Do you understand that? Okay, we are only valued sexually. We are fetishized by our women because we do not run our household, guys. Do you understand that? And, and again, thing, it's, to, it's to our detriment as well. Because if, if let's, let's 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 say let's say hypothetically, since the man's voice is silenced, that we the, we run with that girl's opinion, that becomes our reality. Now the reality is we can't we can't. It's impossible. Instead of the latter, the latter is get out there and get it done. 
And so we've adopted that mentality for our culture just because we've silenced the people who are actually going to go out there and get it done in favor of the people who we're talking about what we can't do. And that's what runs from us. That's pretty much the voice of the culture now. Come on, man. And so, man, if y'all listening, I really hope y'all feeling me. I hope I'm not talking over y'all's head or anything like that. But I'm not lying to you. You know, it's not like I hate black women or anything like that because I don't. Okay. My girl black, she light skinned, but she black still. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, but, but you know, what, I, what I'm seeing though, man, is that like, and, and black men is watching this, listening to this, guys. I want you to really understand this because I was taught this. As much as they talk about how black men are fetishized by other races, if you are not valued for your opinion as a man, you are also fetishized by your own race, okay? Because, and, you, and y'all guys, who, if you're watching this, you're on Twitter as well, you don't get the title of zaddy unless you laying it down in the bed, okay? Mm-hmm. You don't get highly revered by your, your own women unless you are laying it down, all right? Now, that's to our detriment culturally because, again, if our opinions are only valued in sex, we are the whores of our own culture, mm. okay? Mm-hmm. And we're not valued, okay? And so you have to exercise sexual constraint to have some say-so, okay? The minute you fall for the play of, let me like this girl's picture, let me give her some attention, you have lost, okay? You are in a, you are in a daily game, okay? And I'm talking about, you better not even look that way and you will lose your power. These chicks walk past you with a big butt, chest out, you're on the Instagram feed, you're on the Twitter account, you can't, you can't not compliment a woman. You are a sucker and you lose every single time you do it. You lose all your power. Oh, that's a sexual being right there. I know I can get him to do whatever I want to do if I just gave, gave him a little attention, or I gave him some, mm-hmm. some sex. You have to be mm-hmm. like, <clears throat> you know, you have to really be focused, man, because you're playing a game that most of us lose. No, not to know, you know, I can't knock y'all for that. Y'all, y'all lost. Nobody taught you, you know, but you gotta, you gotta exercise sexual constraint, guys, with your, with your attention. Okay. I'm not talking about just porn. I'm talking about Instagram. I'm talking about Twitter. I'm talking about your daily life. You cannot be ogling these women because I'm telling you, you are a sucker waiting to get licked, dog. And if any of y'all older mm-hmm. men watching me, y'all know I'm telling the truth because you've seen this happen in other people's lives. But anyway, I ain't gonna go off on that tangent. I just really care about that. I like it. What else you have for him, Rafael? Yeah, what else? And then we'll let, we'll let him go. Let's get him one more tweet and we'll let him go. Um, uh, y'all got me away now. Well, let's touch real quick. Um, Come on. Make an easy one. My father started his NBA at 65 and finished last yeah. week at 66 years old. Yeah, man. Very proud of him. Yeah, man. You know, pretty black man. Best of black man. Follow us, follow us on Instagram at best of black man. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not like, him on the gram, man. Quick. You said what? Say that again, Rafael. Just talk about it real quick. I mean, just make a little comment, whatever you yeah, want. Yeah, man. Say. So I had, um, I had came back from Canada. Oh, I'm going to give y'all some backstory, man. So my dad has a real estate company. You know, that's what he did growing up. When I was growing up, he left Sears when he was 35 years old. He was a manager at Sears and he got his real estate license and then he opened up his own company. And uh, he did that for my entire life up until um, 2016, he had a heart attack and um, he kind of stopped doing business for a couple of years. And then last year when I got back from Canada, he was like, I think I'm gonna go back to school. I think I'm gonna get my MBA. And so he went through a one year program and dude, like, he didn't know MLA format. He didn't know how to type. You know what I'm saying? He was doing hunt and peck, typing. He didn't know how to, like, research. Like, we know how to research <clears throat> because those things weren't around 50 years ago, you know, 45 years ago when he was in college. And so, you know, he had to learn how to learn all over again at 66 years old, you know, 65, 66. And he passed with four A's and three B's, you know, with his NBA, you know, so – um, super proud of him, man. He's well, he's gonna walk in the spring, um, and it's just a testament to my family. You know, like my brother, uh, his son is a has a doctorate. My other my sister, she's a doctor, and my other sister's a teacher. You know, so it's a testament to our family 
to see him not only get his degree back in you know back in the 70s, but come back and get an MBA, even though he's already been in business for 30 something years, he still goes back and get an MBA. You know, and that's that to me is just like, you know, what is what is possible, right? What can be done? How can we keep pushing the envelope? Not just well as black people, but as a person, what can you do that you don't know you can do right now? You know, and that's um that's an interesting place to be. And um, you know, he pulled out his um I remember he used to take notes all the time, like when he was flipping houses and they were just terrible notes, man. And um I was watching him uh write out, you know, uh, he's he's making a course now for home buyers. And he was just so much more structured, you know, like he was like so much more polished in how he even presented his own ideas to himself. And I said to say this, it's like, okay, so he did that for 30 years. Well, what, what, what would have happened if he had got polished up in 95 or 96, you know what I'm saying? Uh, mm -hmm. And then I look at it like, well, what can I do? What, where can I polish myself up at? So I don't have to wait 35 years from now to be like, all right, let me, you know, get another level of education, but I'm, I'm all for it. And I think that <clears throat> I don't have my degree, but I will be going to university in Brazil next year. Uh, and I, Todd, I told myself, if I ever go back to school, I'm going to Ivy League. So if I go get an MBA, I'm going to have to go off the experience and have my GPA from undergrad and I'm going Ivy League for MBA. So, you know, those, those are my thoughts right now, but um, it's a good feeling, man. It felt good to see my dad do it, especially after having a heart attack because um, it was a pretty big heart attack. Uh, so uh, it's, it, it's a good feeling, you know. One of the things that I, I always tell, well, not always, but I've realized <laughs> is that it's never too late to become what you could have become. And there's a lot of people who think that because they didn't do one thing, that it's a wrap for them because they didn't whatever. Maybe they had a child early. Maybe they uh, didn't go to college. Maybe they got married, got divorced. And I think that that's why I always talk about like the, the, the game of golf. It's such a unique game because it doesn't matter where your first shot lands. All that matters is that you play that next shot very, very well. <coughs> and we, we tend to think that you've got to be successful by 30. You've got to be successful by 25. got to be successful by 35. And we don't realize like the goal is just to become successful, period. And so you might have to pivot mm -hmm. at 35, 40, 45. But that doesn't mean that you can't. It takes you two years to get a degree, one year in your dad's instance. And that one year will set you up for the rest of your life. And so I think mm -hmm. that people who are listening to this, like maybe you, as long as you make your next move, your best move, as long as you make that next step worthy, that's what matters. But so many of us are like, I have cousins who they didn't finish high school. So they feel like, oh, well, you know, if I just would have did what Charles did and did this and this and this, then I'll be where he was. Like, well, bro, like make your next move dope. Like, let's, what's the next yeah. move looking like? But what I'm finding mm -hmm. though is a lot of them just use, use as excuses. They don't really want to do the work. <laughs> they think no, that this didn't, they, they think this wasn't work. It was work. And it still is work. And so like even making your next move is going to be work. Your dad put the work in to get that degree. People are putting the work in mm -hmm. to get out of whatever situation they're in. It it never comes mm -hmm. easy. It didn't come easy when you're 18. It's not going to come easy when you're 35. But it's still possible. No. Yeah, they ain't giving it away, guys. And this is something, this is an idea I want you to introduce you to. I want, you to. I want to introduce you to the formal idea of what Charles just said, and it's called the toolbox fallacy. And it goes like this. If I had this, then I would do this. Okay, so the inverse of that is, if I don't have this, then I can't do this, right? So if I don't have six figures, if I don't have a degree, I can't make six figures. If I attain 30 and I don't have this, then I can't do this. And so you're believing a lie, okay? So you're putting a qualifier in to something that you could just do, right? So you're saying, I could make six figures if I had a master's degree in, in business or, or, you know, I'm a traveling nurse or something like that. Let's take out the traveling nurse part and let's allow your brain to attract money because again, money speaks through energe uh, energetically. It doesn't speak through degrees. So we can talk to money without the qualifier. And that if then statement, right? And so then it's, well, if I am 65, I cannot get an MBA. Now it's, I want an MBA. All right, bam, let's go get an MBA. So remove the self-imposed obstacle, right? So I wanted to go to Brazil when I was 20. I went when I was 30 because I wasted 10. Well, I got a girlfriend now and I can't go to Brazil just yet because I got a girlfriend and I got to wait because she won't want me to go. I did that for 10 years. 
And then one day I just bought the ticket and went. I could have took mm. qualified out of permission, right? Uh, and validation. And I could have just went in, in 2008, 2009 and got it over with, you right. know? And so don't be like me and waste 10 years. <clears throat> just go ahead, remove the qualifier, forget the fa and fallacy, guys. If y'all don't know, if you're not up in your vocabulary, fa fallacy is a lie. So a toolbox of lies. Okay. So you're putting in obstacles and lies in your head and making your subconscious ask the wrong questions. That's another thing, guys, you gotta understand. You gotta ask the right questions to get the right answers. A lot of y'all are saying, why me? You need to start saying, why not me? Okay, why is my marriage mm -hmm. this way? Okay, well, why, do, why am I reacting this way to my manager? Maybe I should react a different way. Well, why is my business not doing this? What have I done in my business to make it to be this way? Okay, a lot of y'all are asking victim a question, you need to be asking victor questions and you'll get Victor answers, okay? Yeah, and another thing I do, guys, I believe that I'm gonna be wealthy. So this is what I do. I believe that all energy is here. So if all energy is already, because energy can't be created or destroyed, right? So if, if I am energy, that means me in the future is here and me in the past is still here because energy can't be created or destroyed. So I ask my future self that's wealthy, I say, Steven, tell me what I need to do. Rich Steven. Billionaire Steven, tell me what I need to do. And I listen, mm -hmm. and then I get the answer because I'm asking the right questions. How would, I, how would I respond to this if I was wealthy? Well, I'll probably do it. All right, bam. We take desperation out of my, my thought, you know, my, my decision making, you know? So if y'all don't feel me, if y'all ain't on this all energy stuff, man, you're a loser anyway, and you need to read up, all right? Because I know I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> Any final words with the, for the people, man? Man, um, I done said a lot already, man. If I ruffled your feathers, that's good. I'm glad you're thinking, okay? Um, also, I think that um, hit me up if you have any questions, guys. Hit me up on Twitter. I just look like this, okay? I'm not a nice guy. I just look like this. I can't grow a beard like y'all. It's so I can look like a fool. <laughs> So, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, but anyway, guys, I, Ty, I always appreciate talking to you, man. I hate, I hate what Twitter did with your account, man. It took your old account away. Uh, Raphael, it was great talking to you on the, on the podcast. And anybody that's still listening, I appreciate all y'all, man. Um, you can always learn something new. You can always be something new. You can always reinvent yourself. If you don't like who you are right now, get a haircut. Change how you talk. Go get a new vocabulary. Go learn a new language like me. You know, you have probably in Portuguese or Guana. Okay, I speak Portuguese now. So like, you don't have to. If you you don't like somebody, cool. speaking, okay. So again, guys, I thank you. I appreciate you. Um, I feel anything else. <coughs> Man, it's a lot of good stuff. Gotta go. I gotta go back and listen to it, man. Dropped a lot of good stuff tonight. Um, had my feathers ruffled. Feeling good. <laughs> I feel like going to the gym in the morning, even though it's like oh, yeah. one thirty. It's like one thirty in the morning. Like man, I feel like I gotta go to the gym. Man. Mm -hmm. Get that energy going. Get that energy going. Okay, um, one more thing, right now. I meant to say uh -oh. this. I meant to man, say this. Don't give me stuff to do now, man. I, I meant to say this. I was following Chris Johnson when he had like 900 followers three years ago. Okay? Just so you guys know, if y'all go listen to Chris and hear everything he said, he was a regular dude. Okay? The guy, he used to listen to podcasts that we were doing three years ago. Okay? And I'm saying all that to say that and even Ty, I remember back before Ty had the Ty, Ty Consultant, Ty Capital, everything. Remember before that? I remember back when he was, had clothes. Y'all know about that. Y'all know Ty from there. I know Ty Whoa. from there. So we can change our lives. Huh? Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so like we don't have to be who we are right now. You know, I was, uh, when I first, I think I first, my first podcast, no, not my first podcast. The first, when I first started interacting with Todd, I was living in Atlanta. I had just moved to Atlanta from Alabama. I had been living in Alabama for 26 years. And then I moved to Atlanta, and then I lived in like freaking 20 cities in the last two years. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So, guys, it starts with a decision. 
I want to be better. I want more for myself. And then you allow Big Mo, and, and Big Mo is your best friend and your worst enemy, and Big Mo is momentum, your big momentum. Allow momentum to pull you, man. Get with some good people, man. Read their, read their, their um, what they're doing in their lives. Get some ghost mentors. Go to YouTube, pick one person that you really like that's at a high level of success and only listen to them. And allow yourself to be brainwashed, okay? A lot of y'all have bad thoughts. You need to drown it out with positive thoughts. You don't have the power to make positive thoughts yet. So take somebody else's positive thoughts and use it as your internal conversation. Mm. All right? I could do this all night. So let me just stop there. Cool, man. Appreciate, appreciate it. We definitely appreciate it, man. I mean, this Raphael, I mean, and we always stay on, on tweet talk. One of our, one of our commandments is kind of like, um, there's a lot of good ideas out there. Pick one and it's not, it's not so much ideas, what you do with it because you are the source. You know, Raphael, I am the source, and Charles is the source, and we know Stephen is the source. You know, we are the source. And what you got to say, Charles? I got to say, don't be a little B. Start a little business. Um, thank you for coming on the show, man. It's been, it's definitely been a, a long time coming. I'm glad we had this platform to allow people to expand on their tweets. And I think a lot of people are going to get a lot of value out of this. And we had a good conversation, too, talking about some some real life issues that affect people. So I had a good oh, yeah. time. We, we dug into it to this time. So, uh, I mean, you always check out the sponsors, check out Mindset Matters Tees. Also check out Tide Capital at gumroad.com backslash Tide Capital. Check out at Blessed Black Man, at Tide Investments. Check out at Tide Millionaire. That is the name on Instagram still. Raphael, any other, any other shout outs? <laughs> uh... Tasha, I gotta stay. Go to gottastay.com slash tweet talk. That's G O D E S T E dot com slash tweet talk for your free 30 minute consultation for financial coaching. Um, shout out to friends to the, to the, to the brother podcast, the Tommy A podcast, but it states Erica Williams, um, and Manny, um, what's the name? Terry Ugioma. Terry Ugioma. Um, right. And um, shout out to, you know, follow us on Instagram at Black Wealth Tweet Talk. That's the, that's the podcast Instagram. Uh, follow us on Twitter, Todd Billy, T-O-D-D-B-I-L-L-I. Uh, Raphael, that's me. That's at Work Money Life. That's how it sounds. We got Stephen Story at Stephen Story. That's Stephen with P-H and Story mm -hmm. with an E. S T E P H E N S T O R E Y, you know, get that good stuff. Um, I mean, that's it, man. You gotta get the PhD, purchase from black businesses, hire black people, deposit in black banks, man. Um, you know, this is Tweet Talk episode 21. It's lit. You're out. Yep. You're out. Peace. <laughs> awesome. Awesome, man.